today we're going to talk about blog box testing of iOS and Android application. Um, to be more specific, we're going to talk about a tool we're using, which is called Infospan. And what it is, is it's a security profile for iOS and Android application. Uh, and by that we mean it's something that helps you understand uh, what an Android audio application is doing at runtime, and it's also meant to help you quickly find security vulnerabilities affecting applications. And we think this will be useful to developers, tech testers, uh, security, security researchers that have an interest in mobile security. So that's what it's about. Uh, and so who are we? So uh, three person actually work on this project, uh, Mark and myself, and also Tom Daniels. And we're all security consultants at a company called um, Isaac Partners, which is uh, based in the United States, in San Francisco. It's a security consultant. So we do a lot of uh, penetration testing on web apps, iOS apps, Android apps. Uh, and a few other things. So what we're going to talk about today, um, as I said, it's about uh, black box penetration testing of iOS and Android apps. So first of all, we'll quickly introduce uh, what mobile security is, what it means, why we care about it. And then we'll describe how you do um, a security testing of an iOS on your application right now, uh, some of the tools you may use, um, and the methodology. And then we'll sort of uh, explain some of the challenges that you might face and why you think that uh, black box testing such as is difficult right now, uh, which will lead us to the next section about the tool in uh, which is designed to address some of those challenges and make the testing much easier. And then we'll have a quick demo on the computer. And Mark is going to talk about mobile security. So I'm going to I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, threats and attack vectors um, those threats may use to try to obtain your data. We are obviously uh, carrying very powerful portable devices, which are storing extremely sensitive data. The devices are almost always on and almost always connected. They are not like laptops, which you can use and then shut down or hibernate. We are constantly using these devices. They constantly have a stream of data flowing in and out over cell network, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth. So with all of that in mind, our data security models are based on laptops, all that's relevant still. <coughs> Malicious applications um, are a significant security risk. Application to application attacks could take place either through legitimate mechanisms, uh, such as overly permissive IPCs, which could compromise sensitive data within a vulnerable application, or through some type of sandbox bypass, which could compromise a phone. So what protections do marketplaces give you? Application stores are not going to catch everything. Applications that violate term of use have appeared in both the Apple App Store and the Android marketplace. <coughs> so third-party stores see, um, have also been shown with Amazon, for instance, and uh, they may have inconsistent bettings. And with side marketplaces for jailbroken phones, all bets are off. So on top of that, um, marketplaces can slow down uh, critical patching too, if a vulnerability is found. For instance, Apple can take up to a week to accept your dated application. That's why some folks are switching back to thinner types that use web views, but all of these applications uh, become vulnerable to web application attack surfaces, and developers don't really uh, understand them very well. So what kind of issues do we find on mobile applications? So the OS top 10 is a good overview of some of the risks, but that shouldn't be considered as the only list of issues you can find in all applications. But it's a good starting point to understand most of them. So where does the sensitive data reside? Well, the first place the data reside is in the server. So the same side of thing is not really the focus of our talk, so let's move on. Um, the next place the data resides is within the communication channel between the client and the server and on the device. 
Once it reaches your device, it could be stored in one or two locations. Your internal storage or in RAM is being accessed. So let's see other issues we care about. For example, if SSL is properly used and our certificate checked, um, there, is, there shouldn't be any manual attacks possible on your applications. Are there any custom crypto implementation that could and will likely have issues? Is there a potential for client-side injections within the <coughs> web view, the native code section, or lo uh, local databases, for example? And lastly, any issues with IPCs, accessible from other applications, containing logic flaws, uh, or not properly filtering the data that is being sent to them? All right, so this was a quick introduction to mobile security in general. Um, and so, as I said, we're going to talk about black box testing. And uh, what we mean by that is that um, you're a tester and you have to test an application, iOS or Android, and you don't have access to the source code. So maybe you uh, download the application from the App Store or the developer just gave you the manual. And you have a specific amount of time to test that application and sort of understand how it works uh, and uh, also find if there are any security problems affecting that application. Um, that's what black box testing is, and uh, there are two main approaches that you can follow when you are doing a testing, and you can do both actually on the same application. The first one is static testing, where uh, you're just going to analyze uh, the application's binary without really running the app, so you're just looking at the binary, uh, decompiling it, looking at the assembly and trying to understand uh, what it's doing. The other methodology is dynamic testing, which is you actually run the application uh, and sort of see what, what happens. Uh, and there are quite a few things you can do uh, as part of the dynamic testing. One would be uh, proxying the application's network traffic. So looking at uh, the <coughs> network requests sent by the application to the server and so you can see uh, sort of what happens behind the scenes and try to understand what kind of data is being exchanged, things like that. Um, I own monitoring, and the one I just talked about is sort of part of it too, uh, where you just look at input and output and see how the app reacts or what it does. So, file system, network, uh, and a few other things, and we'll get into the details of that. Um, you can also debug the application, obviously, so you can use a debugger such as JD, again, to try to figure out how the app works, what it's doing, which function it's calling. Um, and lastly, you can hook functions, um, which means you're going to bash a function with your own code to try to create some kind of uh, issue of unexpected behavior. And we'll get into the detail of that because that's what our tool is using, actually. Um, and so we're going to give a few more details for each platform, <coughs> iOS and Android. So on iOS, dynamic analysis means as I said, look at input outputs. And so on iOS, uh, it's going to be the file in the application's folder, uh, the keychain, which is that location where you're supposed to store uh, sensitive data, and the user preferences. Um, then you have other input outputs, such as IPCs. Uh, you don't have that many IPCs on iOS. You actually only have one that's sort of the official one, which is URS key. And there's another one that you can use, but it's kind of a hack. Uh, which is the baseball. Um, and then again, looking at the network traffic. Uh, if you want to look methods on iOS, you're going to use the one framework that's designed for that, and it's called Mobile Source Trade. Uh, again, we'll get into the detail of that. Um, and then you can debug the application with JDP or a tool called Cypress, which is more for like monitoring the application. Uh, as you're testing an iOS app, you may run into uh, the point where the app doesn't want to run on a job of and to do most of the things that I just talked about, you need to be on a general address. So you may have to figure out how to make the apps think that the address is not a Um And for static analysis, um, the main thing that's different when you're analyzing an iOS binary is that it's encrypted. So when you download an app from the App Store, uh, that, that binary is encrypted uh, with at those fair play the other. So if you want actually want to see the code, you're going to have to decrypt it, which can be done with GDE. 
And once we've done that, you can use all the usual tools, IDA, uh, to make that. Um, not to talk about the same C++ All right, so let's talk about the traditional test on Android. Um, as, I, as I've been explained for iOS, the goal is to understand the application flow, you know, to look for logic or design flaws in your application, but also some specific issues uh, that could be related to encryption or uh, IPCs, for example. So, in a traditional Android test, you could monitor some API calls uh, with JDB, which is a Java debugger, uh, and with GDB for native part using a remote GDB server. So this testing can be also automatized with Studio Substrate, which is the equivalent of mobile substrate on Android, uh, which we'll talk about later. You may also uh, sometimes end up doing some uh, analysis, a memory analysis, um, which um, can allow you to determine what is available and when. Um, so the way to do it right now, I mean, you can do it by just dumping the memory from the prop file system, or leveraging the garbage collector to actually dump a uh, uh, heap memory uh, heap profiler file for you. Um, so static analysis can also be useful, um, especially done when, when uh, in parallel to dynamic analysis. The general idea is to convert an Android binary to a more readable code. So there are two options here. You could decompile into Smiley code, which is a simple uh, assembly-like syntax, but with dynamic opcodes. Or you could decompile to Java, by first decompiling and then use a Java decompiler on that. Decompiling to Smiley is the best option um, to, if you want to modify and add debug information to an application, for instance. Uh, that could be easily, and then you can easily recompile it and resign it, and it will work with your debug uh, embedded into it. Um, but this is something you cannot really do when you decompile to Java, um, because the decompilation can oftentimes fail and can be inconsistent. So, but, but yeah, it has the advantage to uh, be way easier to read. Um, you may sometimes need to go deeper into the analysis too. Um, the core of, of the application will unlikely be native code, but it could have native library used for crypto functions, for example, and you may need to hook into them. Although you have to know what to look for, those functions are called using the Java native interface, which enable Java code to interact with native code. So once you have located the code that uh, interests you, you can just use IDA Pro uh, for reading ARM and instructions and help you understand some sections more easily. In addition, um, applications such as Android Girl uh, can be great to visualize the control flow of the application. <coughs> the tool is usually used for manual analysis, but uh, having a good understanding of the application flow can really help when dealing with an uh, application. So all of the methods described are not automated at all. You need to know what you are looking for, and using a debugger or modifying an application is not extremely straightforward. There are tools on desktop that can perform decent analysis on applications, such as Attack Surface Analyzer, API Monitor, the System Thermal Tool Suite on Windows, for instance. But there is nothing really similar on Android yet. Some of the only tools that could be closer to automated analysis are static analysis tools. But most of the ones available only work by sending an application <coughs> to a website, which is not ideal. And there are a lot of false positives. And it cannot really help you understand the application as you actually use it. There is also Dozer, which is a pretty good tool as well, for um, multi only for IPCs. Uh, it's, still, it's still dynamic, but it's only hooking, uh, or at least only monitoring IPC uh, mechanisms. So since most of the common mobile security issues are well known, it should not be that difficult to test them dynamically with the right tool. And so that leads us to uh, the tool we've been talking about, um, which is called Control Spy. So as I said in the intro, um, it's what we call a security profile for iOS and Android applications. Uh, our main goal was when we started working with was to have something that's very easy to use. Uh, so that you don't have to be a security expert or an iOS or Android expert to just run the tool. Uh, and as I said, it's designed to help you understand an application and find, quickly find security problems. Um, and to, to get into, into the details of how it works, uh, there are, it's made of three things, um, three components. 
Uh, the first one are the tracer, of, what we call the tracer. There's one for iOS, one for Android. It's basically just the application that runs on the device. Uh, and what it does, it, it's going to um, collect data about functions that are being called by the application. Uh, and I'm going to get into the detail of that. Um, the last component is the analyzer. And right now it's only for iOS. We haven't uh, finished it for Android. Um, but it will be there as well. And so the analyzer is just a script that you run on your laptop. And it, the input to the analyzer is the data, all the data that was collected by the tracer. And the output is a nice report that tells you all about the application. Uh, and it will demonstrate it. So you'll be able to see that. Um, so a bit more details about the tracer. So you need a gel bucket or a bit of uh, And the reason why you need that is because it's doing something very uh, Powerful, which is hooking um, the system API. Uh, so, for example, on iOS, the Google Touch API, and on Android, the Android system API. Um, it doesn't hook all the functions, only the ones that we think are interesting. So, only the security sensitive API. Um, and so, it hooks those functions just to log whenever they're called. And so, it logs the fact that it was called, and then it also logs the arguments in the return value. So whenever an application calls those secret sensitive API, we just log that. Um, and the way we coded it, coded it was using uh, CDI software on Android and mobile software on iOS, which are framework to really easily hook functions. Um, and so it logs all those things and then it stores them in a SQLite database on the device. So that was one database per application. Uh, and one thing you could also do is ask the tracer to so display everything that's being logged uh, to the console. Um, and so specifically about the iOS one, so as I said, it's using mobile substrate. Uh, mobile substrate is a really uh, powerful and cool uh, framework. Uh, it lets you hook any function, C or Objective-C, and you need a job of any device. And I feel like uh, if, you're, if you're testing iOS applications, you definitely need to know how to use this super useful and powerful. Um, not too bad. So this is a quick example. This is intro spy code. Uh, it just shows you how you ex the code you have to write to hook something. Um, and the main thing you have to see, I don't know if everyone can see, but the main thing is the, actually the last line, which says ms hook function. So ms is for mobile subscribe. Hook function means you want to replace a function. And so in that case, uh, we, are, we are hooking the function called rand. So rand is a C function uh, to get random numbers. But the problem is that the random numbers you get from the function are very not random at all. Um, and so the reason why we want to log that is because if your application is using that, that's a problem, probably. So we want to know when you're coming up. It's bad. And so back to that last line, MS hook function, the first argument is the function you want to replace, so rand. Uh, the second argument is the function that should be used instead. So in that case, it's called replaced rand, which is defined right above. And I'll explain it. And the third argument is a pointer, uh, and mobile substrate is going to make that pointer point to the original rand function in case it's still need to call it. Because now when you call rand, you're actually going to replace RAM uh, inside the application. And so if you look at replace RAM, that's just intro spy code. I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically the first line is uh, orange result equals uh, original RAM. So I'm, I'm calling the original RAM function and storing the result. Then the next few lines are how we just log those things. So we store the fact that RAM was called and we store the return value and a few other things. And then I just return the original value. So in, in like six lines of code, uh, you can do something like this powerful. And so the tracer is like that for everywhere. So all those APIs that we're hooking, that's how it's done. Uh, you can see it in the code um, online. All right, so I said we are, we are hooking security sensitive APIs. So on iOS, uh, what we mean by that uh, is quite a few things actually. All the crypto framework. Because we think that if an application is doing some crypto, it's 
definitely going to be something interesting that a tester will want to know. Uh, so the, the, the framework is called Common Crypto on iOS. So you have all those functions, CC Crypto, CCH, Mac, Digest, and then other functions like RAN. Um, and IPCs, so I already talked about that. Uh, the baseball and URI kind of, sorry. Um, the file system, because it means that obviously uh, some files are traded, so you probably want to know what kind of data is in these files and it's sensitive. Uh, and so on iOS, you have to there's a bunch of APIs you can use, such as NS data and so on. And it's file manager. So we're hooking that as well. User preferences. Uh, you see a lot of applications that just store lots of things in user preferences. Uh, the keychain, which is that specific location where you have to store sensitive things. So uh, to a tester, it's interesting to have an insight into that because it will give you maybe some password that may be useful to say something else. And there's also more things. Um, and if you want the whole list of everything we are uh, touching, it's on uh, the tools website. And Mark is going to talk about the, the Android tracer. Um, so on Android, um, the intro spy is leveraging a CDI substrate. It's very easy to install uh, as the framework is available on the marketplace. Introspy comes as an application package that is automatically installed um, when you when you use it on the phone, and it works with uh, Android 2.3, uh, 2.3 to 4.3. Um, all of the hooks are basically done at the Zygote process layer. So the Zygote process is kind of a template process with a VM and libraries loaded that are basically forked. Um, it's, uh, that basically forks itself each time uh, an application is launched. Um, by, so by injecting code into that process, it means all of the apps on the device get the hooks, which allow you to test basically everything on the device, including system applications, just everything. Um, uh, so Retrospy actually filters that, but you can just uh, be very loose and just filter as much as you want, or at least analyze as much as you want. So there, uh, there is at least one other framework on um, CDS substrate that was released uh, uh, some time ago, I can't remember, I uh, got exposed. Uh, but it doesn't actually work with native code, so most of the site actually uh, works very, very well with native code. And uh, it makes sense to be slower too, since we are hooking really a lot of uh, methods, uh, we need speed for that specific uh, uh, tool. So on Android, there are classes containing methods that are hooked with the tracer uh, that are listed here. Um, so this is really a very short list to give you an idea about what we what we hook. Um, so it's basically hook common method Alban already described regarding the crypto, for instance. Uh, but it also gives more information on IPCs, specifically on Android, where way more are actually can potentially be accessible uh, to other apps um, and what is being sent to them and all of the intents being sent to them. So uh, that can be later used to do fuzzing, for instance. When you know the content being sent to, to the apps, you can actually leverage that and do some smart fuzzing with it. So it's actually very uh, very useful. In the regarding the file system, shared preferences, uh, URI, handlers, logging, and uh, obviously how SSL is used. All right, and so the last the last uh, <laughs> intro is the analyzer. Uh, as I said, it's just a Python script that's on, on your own computer. Uh, and what it does, it's only for iOS right now. Uh, it connects to your device over SSH, and it's just going to get all the intros by databases that are available. Um, and then it's just going to process them and give you uh, a few things. Uh, you can get an HTML report uh, out of the database, and you can also ask the analyzer to list specific things. Uh, you can list all the files that were accessed by you, uh, or all the URLs it connected to. Um, but Enough with talking about the tool, uh, let's do a quick demo, if that works. Um, so, okay. So I have an iPod Touch with me. Um, so I'm just going to demonstrate the trust file on iOS first, and then Mark will do the Android one. Um, so it's already installed, uh, it's super easy to install, it's just a package. So I'm going to build that. 
once you install it, uh, you get two new settings in your setting tab on the device. Uh, which was by apps and which was by settings. Uh, the first one is where you can choose which application you are interested in. Uh, so it has all the system applications, as you can see, so App Store, um, iTunes, yeah. and then all the uh, user applications, which means App Store applications. And so for each one of them, you can say, oh, I want to look at, I want to to log everything, or I don't want to to touch it. Uh, in that case, I'm going to enable it for that CBS app. The other setting is uh, uh, it, uh, it helps you control what the tracer does. Uh, the, thing, the first setting, uh, log to the console, um, it just tells the tracer whether you want to display everything that's being logged to the console. Um, and then you have a few options where you can uh, decide that which API you want to hook, which API you want to log. Uh, so they're grouped together as like, uh, sort of logical groups, so file system, user preferences, keychain, uh, common crypto. So you can decide that maybe you want to hook something specific. Um, the main reason we have that feature is that some of those APIs are very noisy. Uh, for example, the preferences can be extremely noisy when you have an app that's constantly checking the preferences to see if the user did something. Uh, and once you know what's in the preferences, you don't really care about when the app is checking them, so you can just uh, remove that and uh, focus on the other APIs. For now, I'm just going to leave everything on. Um, so that's it for the settings. And so now I'm just going to run an app. So on Xcode, you can see uh, the console, which is why I have it here. Uh, the, the resolution is So, so the, the app I'm going to test it was found is CBS. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a Netflix app, so you can run that and watch TV shows that belong to the CBS network. Um, there's no vulnerabilities when I'm disclosing anything. Uh, there's nothing scary. Uh, the only reason why we use the app is it does a lot of things behind the scenes. So it's a good example on all the things in files. Uh, so I'm just going to run that app. And so one thing you can see is that in the, the console is very pretty. Um, because that's all the stuff in Trospy is in. Um, I'm just trying to stop it. Uh, so for example, this one. So it's going to say Trospy and then the function that is called uh, sec item copy machine. Uh, it's a function to access the key change. And then you get all the arguments that were used. Um, those are a bit complicated, so I'm going to use a different uh, example. Um, for example, those connections. So, okay, this one is good. So, this one is it's reading a file. So, it's using init data. Data with another file. So, that's one way to read a file on iOS. And the arguments are the path. So, that's the path of the file. Uh, and then the return value is the actual return of the file. So it's just telling you that some file is read. Um, it's not very practical because there's a lot going on, but this can be useful when you want to see what happens when you press some, like a specific button and see in real time uh, what it does. Um, all right. And so it's not working, but that's okay. Yeah, so you can watch TV shows. Okay, so that's it for the tracer. Now I'm going to use the analyzer. Um, as I said, it's a Python script. Um, so it shows by the Python. You can do a few things. So I'm going to give some examples. But as I said, it connects over SSH. So you have to give it the IP address to your device. Uh, in that case, it's, uh, it's the loopback interface because I'm doing this over the USB cable. So I don't have to rely on the Wi-Fi. But this should be the device IP address, to be clear. Uh, so a few things you can do. One is you can list all the URLs that were accessed uh, during that brief uh, time. Um, so it's Dutch IFTP. And so it connects over SSH, so it's going to ask for your password. 
And then it lists all the interest type databases that are available, all the apps that you uh, looked at with interest type. Um, so Twitter, CBS, the weather app. Uh, but I'm not interested in the CBS app, so I'm just going to choose the first one. So this is the list of all URLs that are accessed by the app. Um, can be useful if you want to see if there were like some HTTP URL that should be HTTPS uh, or some unexpected domain. Um, you can do the same thing with files, so you can list all the files that have been accessed. Uh, but now I'm just going to show you um, how you can generate HTML reports. Um, so it's the same thing. I just use a different comment. So it just generated a report, and now I'm just going to open it. Um, CBS. Alright, so that's how it looks like. Um, there are two pages. The first one is called Trace Calls, the other one is called Initial Findings. Trace Calls is the list of everything that was done uh, by Introspect. Every security sensitive. Function that was called. Um, so for each function, it's going to give you, um, as I've shown in the console, uh, the function that was called, so and its data, data with a file, and the argument. So in that case, a file was read that labels the grade, version, and such things, and the kernel of the file, which is based on point coding. Um, so that's useful because it tells you what the application is doing uh, in like five minutes. So, since there's a lot of data, uh, we've put uh, filters so you can hide everything, and then you can decide if you're only interested in specific APIs. So, for example, only the keychain, and so you can see all the calls to the keychain. Uh, for example, second item add is how you add something to the keychain. So you can see, oh, they put something in the keychain, what it is. So you can get the data and try to understand what, why it's doing this. And what it means. Um, another example that's really useful is uh, the crypto. So Dan is doing some crypto uh, behind the scenes. I don't know why. I haven't looked into it, but it's very interesting because you can see which algorithm is being used. So AES128, the data that's being encrypted. Uh, so it's some kind of token. So I mean, the whole point of IntroSpy is that it gives you insight into the app, so then you can sort of investigate and have ideas on what you should be looking at. So this looks interesting. Uh, then the ID, the data that's encrypted, data out, the key that was used, um, and some options. So that's, I mean, I've seen apps where you can see the keys like password and the ID is now uh, things like that. And you can catch that really quickly. Uh, with that tool. Uh, you can see calls to random as well. So that's pretty much it for the first page. Uh, you can see IPC, so it'll give you the URL schemes uh, that the application has, CBS. So if you open the link that's not the CBS going, it's going to run the app, so that's interesting. Um, so yeah, it's pretty powerful. Uh, the next, page, the other page, which is kind of uh, the more experimental one, uh, it seems that the tester should definitely see because they are very interesting. Uh, so basically, in that case, IntroSpy complains about a few things. The first one, for example, is that uh, they are putting something in a keychain, but are not specifying uh, the data protection level. Uh, the data protection level is something you can uh, specify, and there are different levels, like from let's call it very secure to not so secure. Without going into the details. Uh, and so that can be saying that, oh, well, they'll put something in the keychain, but it didn't specify the level of protection they want. So, uh, prior to IO6, it's actually a problem. Uh, then it says, oh, the base form is being used. Uh, so that's interesting because 
every app on the device can access the data. So if you have sensitive data in it, it's a problem. Um, and the last one is it's complaining about the fact that um, the app is going around, which could be a problem because of what they are doing the, uh, the output of RAND. And so it tells you what the problem is, and then all the robot function calls, so you can see. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for iOS. Um, so yeah, Mark is going to talk about it. Alright, so I'm going to test um, similar hacks for C CBS. Um, I don't have an internet connection right now, so it will only show you the when you first run the application, but you can see so if you have a connection. Um, let's see. Right, so um, to get the log um, related to the application, you just need to run uh, ITV, which is uh, a way to connect you to the device uh, over USB. Uh, so So then you can feel the IP switch. 
from the industry sector. So you tell me this is what happened when you run the application. Uh, so I'm gonna try another app. Um, so I'm gonna use the last app. Um, I'm gonna use it because it can give you a good, good insight into what the application can do for you when there is uh, some friction or, or when the app actually tries to replicate something. Um, so we just, we actually discovered uh, that with that path and this uh, mechanism to take the snapshots of the system, it actually, it is actually blank. Uh, so that path is, is there. Yeah, the view doesn't work.
We're actually using the library that you guys are using for pinning, oh and right. we, we want to when we do in introspection, we want to turn it off. So right. it's you know. Oh, yeah. So um, did you find any apps yet that won't be having this feature? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a tool we use on our product on the project. It's all working to be set up right now. So we actually did it around, and then, yeah, it's really helpful to have this problem. For sure. Right. Uh, I don't think I'd say anything now. Anyone else? Well, it means that they would have to have their own crypto blockchain, right? Their own AES blockchain, right? To be able to transfer money, yeah. which, which helps a lot. Or maybe they're using it on Twitter because they want to write the system as well. But most of the apps just use what they have to bring up with. Yeah. 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 And this is a generative data set and it's cached on a blockchain? Yeah. Are you going to think about it? Yeah, they would have their own. So the put um, function is except it's just swizzling the, the object to see uh, whether it's correct. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, big round of applause for Nicholas. <laughs>